Alright, welcome. Welcome. Uh, my name is Kieran McMillan and I am uh, giving a, a, the next session here, which I am entitling uh, Visualizing Big Bang, although the, my talk has m mutated somewhat from what uh, is, is listed in the abstract. Uh, I'd first like to thank the uh, presenters. I'd like to thank uh, Urs and Werner and Lucas Fabian for inviting me to come uh, to the conference. This is an, an amazing thing. Uh, and thanks to the university and everybody who's helping out uh, making this such a, such a successful event. Um, I'm involved in three sessions uh, this, this uh, conference, and uh, one already happened yesterday, and uh, one is happening tomorrow. And those two uh, were fully formed in my mind when I, when I signed up, uh, when, I, when I suggested what I might uh, present. This one uh, was uh, struggling. I was struggling with exactly what it was going to be. Uh, the, this session is a theory uh, sub-part of, of a larger conference on engraving. And so, while I started out building a uh, session which was very heavily uh, theoretical, it was uh, lots of examples, lots of, of uh, pre-built um, visuals. As I started to figure out who was at the conference here and, and uh, the, the, the breadth of experiences that I might be talking to, uh, I, I had a slight readjustment to what uh, is going to be presented. So it's now visualizing Weber theory and engraving in the 21st century. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, how, how uh, can engraving tools help theory, theorists and uh, regular people, if you will, civilians, um, uh, to understand music more and, and uh, appreciate things. And I'm Coming at it through the lens of Weber, using some examples from Weber, uh, but it's uh, it's expanded slightly from its from its original talk. So why this talk at all? Why why have a talk about uh, visualizing anything? Never mind Weber. Again, thinking back to what the conference uh, is about, music and engraving in the twenty first century, uh, there is. In, in the 20th century and before, engraving was very specifically for the score. Uh, the, that term just meant getting musical information onto a page. That has changed dramatically uh, in the last 20, 25 years, to the point where now music engraving means uh, theoretical examples, it means um, uh, documents, uh, uh, complete uh, editions, and, and critical documents, and a uh, whole bunch of other uh, elements of what music engraving can be involved in. And I thought about uh, who might be here in, the, in the, the crowd, and I thought probably there are some of you who are theorists, and some who are composers, and some who are engravers, and some who are just amateurs, uh, musicians, and some who are a combination thereof. Uh, I am sort of definitely these two, a composer and an engraver, uh, I'm an amateur theorist, <laughs> uh, and when I thought about what, uh, what I might be presenting, uh, of course I had this grand idea of, of breaking some great new ground in theory, uh, and then I realized that this equation holds true for all music theorists. They're, all theorists are greater than I am in terms of my, of my understanding and my, my uh, ability to really break new ground. So rather than focus on trying to break new ground, I went back to the music engraving in the 21st century idea, and I thought, how can I apply my knowledge of lily pond, my understanding of theory, my experience as an engraver of Schenker graphs and uh, things like that, to talk about how we might move forward. So I will talk a little bit about traditional engraving, uh, analytical engraving, I'll show some examples, and I'll also uh, brainstorm, I'll, I'll present some ideas and some, some examples of potential new uh, 
uh, tools and, and approaches that we should be thinking of as we go forward. <coughs> Why visualize any music? Music is visualized already in the score. We see the all of the detail, hopefully the composer and the engraver and the editor, if there's one in there, uh, worked closely together to make sure that the page represents everything that is, is visually uh, coherent for that piece. So why would we try to re-visualize it? The first reason is that per perhaps the score itself is quite complex. And we want to simplify it in some way. We want to reduce any uh, noise, any extra information that is getting in the way of us interpreting some portion of that music. We want to highlight some elements. Could be that we're highlighting the harmonic uh, content, it's maybe the melodic content, it's perhaps intervallic, uh, it's structural, it's formal, it's uh, it, orchestrational. Whatever it is, we try to uh, re contextualize the data that's in the score to present it in a way that highlights some particular piece uh, that we're interested in presenting. If we visualize in a clever way, we will perhaps uncover patterns that are not uh, immediately obvious from the score. Uh, one of the things, of a Schenker graph, for anybody, does everybody know, uh, has everybody worked with Schenker graphs? And, Ish. I've got some ishes. I've got some. <laughs> okay. Um, a Schenker graph, which I'll show a couple of examples of, uh, is essentially, uh, I'm going to really <coughs> simplify it here. It is a, a skeleton, it is a, an interpretation of a possible skeleton for a piece. Uh, and it presents a, um, it, with using musical notation in a very clever way, it presents a, a map of usually a, a tonal piece that uh, shows you the big, the big milestones in the piece, the bones of the piece as it, as it unfolds. And it gets rid of all of the little filigree that gets in the way of seeing that skeleton. So hopefully we can use engraving uh, to illuminate patterns in the music. And once we have all of that other stuff taken out of the way, now there's a real uh, potential for comparison and contrast. Uh, if we're looking at two full orchestral scores, one is a Mozart, M Mozart 40 and one is Beethoven 7, and we say, uh, talk to me, just by looking at the score like that, talk to me about the harmonic uh, motion, compare the harmonic motion. That's a difficult task. If we have a reduction of that down to some analysis form, then we can say, ah, it's moving more slowly in Beethoven, whatever the answer is. This is a Schenker graph. Uh, this is one that I engraved in Lily Pond. Oh, I forgot to thank everyone involved in Lily Pond. Um, I'm not sure I'd have a career in music <laughs> without Lily Pond. Uh, this was, I engraved for the Integral, the, the Music Theory Journal, Eastman School, and it's a Rachmaninoff. This is the Rachmaninoff Vespers. It's a it's a one verse of the Rachmaninoff Vespers, and as you can imagine, the Rachmaninoff Vespers is an immense work with eighty staves and six hundred people singing. Uh, but the this particular analyst uh, broke it down and, and got rid of all the details that, that he felt were unnecessary, and uh, indicated that the that this particular strophe of the of the uh, vespers unfolds like this: that there is a, a dominant melodic line that, that descends there, and these are the important harmonic uh, milestones in the piece. And this um, analysis wasn't even simple enough, so the analyst uh, reduced it even more. Uh, as you can see, it uses musical notation in a sort of non-traditional, non, uh, that doesn't look like real music, it doesn't act like real music. These, these um, the way the voices lead is not a, a traditional uh, musical notation. The arrows aren't, aren't uh, used in the same way that they would be in a musical, a standard musical score, these, you know, weird beamings and things. 
So uh, Schenker sort of co-opted the musical notation system in order to come up with an analysis. Yes? Yeah, so question. Um, how compressed time-wise is this uh, thing you're showing? So how much, how many bars does this take in the actual school? That was 150, I think it was 152 bars. I recall correctly. Uh, yes, so that's a Schenker graph. So why talk about visualizing Weber in particular? Why not Rachmaninoff? Uh, here is a excerpt of the Weber piece, uh, string quartet, and you can see that it is it's fairly dense. How, how many people are, are familiar with Weber's music? Awesome. Um, so I I happen to love Weber for a number of reasons. Uh, the reason I wanted to use Webern as my way in is that he is a master of time, compression, and expansion. So sometimes you can, you can have a 45 second movement for orchestra that feels like you've been in there an hour. And sometimes uh, you have an unbelievable number of notes going by in a, in a short period of time. So there's a horizontal compression and expansion that's very interesting and very uh, manipulable. There's also vertical compression and expansion, which is really interesting. Uh, lots of octave displacements. Uh, and when we try to analyze, we might crush that down into something that, that's much more um, approachable uh, intuitively. And I sort of just call this event density. It seems to me like Weber's uh, music is highly dense in terms of the events that are happening. And unfortunately, it's not easy. <laughs> I call this the hidden beauty because it's not—it's really not easy to. I, I call my mom and dad in, and I say, "Listen to this awesome Opus Five," and I drop the needle, and then they just—they're out. Right? Um, but if people can see the beauty, if they can, sometimes that will allow them to hear the beauty. Yeah? And that's part of what we want—I uh, I, think—what we want to use engraving and analysis for is to demonstrate that there is deep beauty in there if you can get yourself past some of the other stuff. Um, I have a little side here. I, I wrote a companion piece for, speaking of people not seeing beauty, um, I wrote a companion piece for Puro Linaire, a Schoenberg piece. And does everyone know that? Also not an ear-friendly work. Um, and so what I did was I, I wrote this piece which was 27 minutes long, and the idea was that at the end of my piece, right, at, just as the soprano was singing the last note, it would go seamlessly into Pure Linaire, and then we'd continue performing Pure Linaire. So the whole show was about an hour, and we told everyone there's half of it is my music and half of it is Schoenberg, so just there's no intermission. The audience uh, at the end of the at the end of the pr presentation applauded. I came down and bowed, uh, and then we started milling about because it was the end of the concert. And after about 10 minutes, I looked up in the audience, and there were still five or six people in the audience. And eventually, I, I figured something was wrong. So I went up and I said, you, you realize the concert's over? And they said, when are you going to play the Schoenberg? <laughs> so what we had done was, we had somehow tricked them into listening to Pierrot Lemaire without actually understanding that they had done that. Uh, and I was one of the great uh, revelations of my life is that you can, you can actually trick people into loving what, what otherwise, if you, if you try to play for them, might be uh, inaccessible. Weber and me, a brief history. Uh, the very first time I encountered Weber was 1990. I sang in Friedhof Leichten uh, in a choir. We went touring around, and it was, uh, if anyone doesn't know this piece, it's, it's uh, immensely beautiful. It's a double canon. Uh, uh, in a uh, double retrograde canon, and uh, for, for a cappella choir, it's immensely beautiful. Uh, I then <coughs> went to school, and I was studying, and one of the things we studied were the string quartets, and I fell in love further with the um, In 2005, I had this idea, because everyone, does everyone know how Weber died? It's a yeah. tragic... Uh, he was shot in 1945 in Mitchell by an American soldier. And I had this idea for a production, a play, where uh, the, the curtain comes up and 
Vagrant steps out to smoke his cigar, and the American soldier steps out and fires the gun, and then for an hour, the bullet is crossing the stage. And we experience, kind of like Vagrant's uh, compression and expansion, we experience the entire event of that half second, uh, and it takes us an hour to experience it. Uh, so I'm actually working on that. I'm going to skip past the new missile system for a second. This is a show that I'm writing called Invariance, and it's going to be uh, hopefully done this year. Uh, and uh, that's my experience with Weber so far. I am studying the string quartets right now because Invariance is uh, based, it's, there's going to be a live string quartet playing the show. So, visualizing materials is one way that we can um, get into a score. We can try to find out what the, what the composer was using as, its, as their fundamental building blocks. Scales and tone rows, chords and pitches, intervals and gestures, we can break it down, uh, and a whole bunch of other potential options there. I've chosen two um, tone rows. Uh, do I need to introduce to anyone what a tone row is, or is everyone pretty solid with that? Okay, so here are the 12 pitches uh, presented in a certain order that Faber chose. Um, and this is the, the, the main tone row for Opus 20. This is the main uh, tone row for Opus 28, uh, for that movement of uh, Opus 28. Um, and what I want to do here is uh, show, oh, no, sorry, went one, one slide too soon. Um, oh. <laughs> So I have the two tone rows here, and in Lily Pond, I've got, I've got the, the uh, Clutter uh, tone row there, and the Chamber Symphony uh, tone row there. And if I engrave this, I can see them side by side, as it were, right? But, but, but above each other. And it's hard for humans to figure out patterns immediately from, from looking at that. Can anyone tell me if there are intervals just right off the bat? Are there intervals that are matched in there anywhere? And if so, what's the offset? These are the kinds of things that, that humans don't particularly do that well, but it's interesting information. We can see there's a basic shape, look like it might be an inversion, uh, but it's, it's difficult for us to really parse that out. If I ask my computer, really fun, to put the intervals in there, right? suddenly I am exposing more information to a user, and uh, I, can, I can see, oh, plus one, plus one, minus three, plus one, plus one, minus three, that's great. Minus six, uh, uh, <coughs> minus one, minus six. Yeah, minus one, minus six, plus one, minus one, minus six, minus six, plus one. Uh, there are actually uh, three in there, I just can't find that one. Oh, and uh, three minus one, minus three minus one, minus one. <laughs> I've lost it down here. Oh, one, one, minus three, one, one, minus three. So we have some patterns that are, that are suddenly obvious. What would be great is if we engraved it so that that was even more obvious. And, lo and behold, I have done just that. So now, I've taken uh, the chamber symphony score and uh, the tone row, and I've transposed it, and I've offset it so that we can see, and harmonically that's the same, and then we have a four pattern there, and then this is matched through those four. What would be really great is if it drew a little frame around it for you, right? Then you would end up with something like, oh, ah. end up with something like this. Right? This is, this would be really great for, for a computer to do this automatically. And it's using uh, engraving to, to expose something about the, about the piece and how, uh, and how these two pieces are potentially related in the composer's mind, or uh, either unconsciously or consciously. I have to go back. I apologize. Mm -hmm. All right. So what uh, 
people tend to do with these tone rows is they, they uh, figure them out and then they want to turn them into a graph that we can use a, a, a matrix. Uh, and this is a 20th century version of the matrix uh, where someone has gone in and, and very carefully worked it out and then typed it into a, into a, a typewriter or a typesetter. But again, it would be so great if the computer just did that for us. And we happen to have some wonderful people out there that uh, built Lily Pond and, and work with Lily Pond. And I can put in a tone row, and it will automatically generate not just the letters, I could do that if I wanted, but the actual music. So now I can see, at a glance, the the, the rows that are transposed in the, in the original order, in the retrograde order, in the inversion, and so on. So the big question is, in the 20th century, how, how, can engra how did engraving help us? And in the 21st century, how can computers help? So humans are, are, are visual species. We really do love visual, that's why movies are so, so popular, and, and color always trumps geometry in photographs. So how can computers help take advantage of that? Uh, through programmatic pitch manipulation, through parameterized layout control like I did with the, with the, uh, the grid, the templates and style sheets that will, will give us uh, hints as to the contents of the piece that we're analyzing. These are all really powerful and interesting tools that we should be taking advantage of as engravers. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Uh, here's an example of, again, a 20th century analysis that someone did by hand, but this is something that a computer should, should and, and could be able to do. Uh, and it's highlighting certain intervallic relationships. And all of that analysis uh, can be done um, automatically we wanted to. Uh, when you look at something like this, this is um, the, the SATS for the string quartet, uh, for string trio, sorry. If I'm interested in the rhythmic content of that, I can parse it out from the, from, from the score, but why would I do that when I could ask my computer to do that? I can go over to my SATS score here, and I can engrave it. Uh, there we go. It's going to engrave. Okay, so I did a, a very simple input of the, of the notes from the first four bars there. I didn't add all of the little details. But what I can do is I can add. Just 
down to the, the information that we're interested in. Uh, visualizing events. When I look at this, this is the beginning of the second movement of Opus 28. Uh, I look at that and, and I, you know, rhythmically it's not particularly complex, but I don't really understand the pitch relationship there very well. So what I want to do is apply some sort of algorithmic thing and end up with a reduction. But not just a simple reduction, like cram all that into one, two stages, but get it down to just the pitch classes that are used for that in the order that, they, that they're presented. And I have, as, as you see, I have a really pond, uh, I've done it in really one way. And it ends up looking like that, which is, now I can, now I can kind of grasp the, the intervallic content that, that, he's, that he's struggling with in there, that he's, that he's manipulating. Um, there are a couple of, of engraving things there. I, I did it fairly quickly, but uh, perhaps more interesting than this view, oops. That was an interesting view, but I will get back to it in a second. Perhaps more interesting uh, than that is if we put it on a six stave, a six line staff, where every uh, space or line is a semitone, right? Because all of those uh, all of those accidentals and things get crushed in there. But we can put it on a six line staff and make each line a, uh, a semitone. And now we have a dodecaphonic staff event graph. <laughs> the lowest line is a zero. It goes zero, one, two, three, all the way up to 12, right? Now we don't have to deal with accidentals. We don't have to deal with uh, the co colliding, especially in the, in the modern notation system. If you have an F and an F natural and an F sharp together, they, they're, it's uncomfortable to kind of read there, right? So compare this view, which is already superior for uh, analyzing quickly what's going on in the, in, the, in the piece, compared to that, which is unbelievably clear to me. Take another piece of paper, throw it into this same algorithm, lay them on top of each other, and see where the patterns, where does he use uh, large intervals uh, you know, the largest intervals, where are they compressed? Where, uh, th that kind of analysis can, can be done once we've gotten it into this form, yes? Did you do uh, another kind of representation where this, this uh, 12 tone step would not represent the pitches, but the row numbers? That would, of course, would uh, it sort of another step, but I would like to see that. It sort of happened that way because, um, if you'll, you'll notice that it never gets beyond the top and bottom. I compressed it at this no, stage. No, I, I don't, no, not in the sense of pitch class, but of the row, row number, oh. the serial number. So if you I see, another right, oh, what a great idea. Does everybody understand what he just, that blows my mind. That's so, what a great idea. It would be more than another set of Of trans but translation, but it would be really easy to do. I love that idea, that's it. Um, so these are ways, yes, sir. Uh, probably this is stupid, but uh, if I look at the source code, this does not look as if it's generated algorithmically from the... It's not. Yes. But you, you could do this. But you could certainly do this. Absolutely. Yeah. Because I know some people on the list that might be able to... Oh, I'm sure if we just gave <laughs> Martin five minutes, we'd be done. You know? <laughs> um, and, and that is, that's what we, that's what I want. That's what we want, I think, as theorists. To, to whatever degree I'm a theorist, uh, that's what you should want if you're a theorist, <laughs> is an algorithmic uh, uh, compressor where you can take, like these are the steps, right? You take that and you put it, and the first step is it gets it to there, and the second step is it gets it to maybe there and your version of it, which is the tone row representation. That one would be really interesting. I don't know if it's interesting, but I would like to see, I would like to see what it is. is it? If we can see, we can... We can tell whether it's interesting. That's exactly what I mean by that visualization uh, showing you patterns that you might not have even conceived of before. And it, it may not turn out to be interesting. It might just be one, one, two, one, two, three, <laughs> you know, like... Yeah. It also be an interesting information. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, <coughs> I'm going to figure out where I am in this. Oh, 
So, uh, here's another, now this isn't Weber, <laughs> I'm stepping away from Weber, but this man, uh, who you may know at Google, I don't know, uh, Martin, because there are only, what, six people that work at Google, uh, <laughs> Martin Wachter, <laughs> he has a tool, this is, uh, I think this one's pure use, uh, where it recognizes repeated patterns uh, that, so this is, you know, and then it comes back, and then way back at the end, there's a da 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 uh, right at the end of the piece. The, to apply something like that to a Weber piece and say, uh, what I'm interested in is rhythmic repetition, maybe not pitch uh, material, or pitch material, or both, to be able to say, to, to have the, the uh, parameters to say, show me the way that the repetition, the way that he, and, and knowing Weber with all of his invariants and, and repetitions and uh, inversions, it would be quite an interesting graph to look at, I think. Uh, so, again, to try to do this as a human would be unthinkable, but we now have the power in the 21st century to throw, and, and this, this man has created such things, uh, we throw MIDI information in that case. You throw MIDI information into this tool, and out comes a visualization uh, of the repetitive patterns in the music. Oh, that one was... Um, it's a Beethoven piece, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, in the 21st century, to conclude, in the 21st century, um, I, I think engraving can take advantage of computer-assisted analysis and visualization, coupled with engraving tools. It's not just that it generates a stream of data, but that it actually visualizes it. We see uh, some recontextualization of the, of the uh, music data. Collaborative platforms where, for example, I've typed in my uh, code, uh, maybe it's an MEI, uh, there's an MEI code for the, the Langsamer Satz, and you want to take that code and apply some algorithm to it, and then someone wants to take your output and do something else with it. That kind of collaborative platform is in our grasp now. Um, and then what happens beyond, all of this has been pretty well stuck to the printed page, but I would love to see, especially with this view here, I would love to see a scrolling graph. Uh, uh, just one long line of music, and I see this launch itself as it goes, and then, music, and then I see it arrive at, at the, the score as it comes back. I see it descending onto my, <laughs> my graph. I see all the little ones unfold as I go. Uh, sorry. There we go. Um, color. We don't use color uh, on, on paper, but we might as well in a, in a computer world. And interactivity, maybe the, the parameters of what you're looking for, or which algorithm you're applying to which section, could be uh, manipulated uh, interactively with the computer. And that is my uh, talk on <laughs> visualizing paper. Any questions or discussion? Yes, yes. Um, I, I wonder maybe another possibility that maybe it's done already or it doesn't happen. But, uh, Recognizing in a, an unknown piece, uh, mm. like we find a, is this Mozart or is it? That's very hard, and and still will be hard. But when you analyze it, yeah, there are uh, fingerprints that you can right? Yeah, you well, can take. Yes, and, the, 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 and they're definitely working. Uh, there, there are lots of people working on that problem, and they've made great yeah. progress. Uh, but it's not 100%. No. Uh, it's neither 100% accurate, nor is it 100% um, that the interface is easy to tap into. Right? The data has to be in a certain format in order to put it in, and then yeah. it translates it into a fingerprint. Uh, but yes, that's a that's a really useful um, application of an analysis to say how much compression, uh, in analytical terms, how much compression do you is is the maximum in order to still be able to match, have a, have a positive match against some database somewhere. Right? Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Uh, 
I wonder if there is a, some kind of tool to recognize, recognize uh, all kinds of inversions, uh, retrogradients, and stuff. Because for analysts, it's pretty tedious work to do by hand, and it's not the most important one. Uh, I think absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I could imagine a tone row database somewhere, or, a, or an interval, uh, a pitch class set database somewhere, where you'd be able to tap in and, uh, through some API and say, you know, are there match? Is there is there a perfect match? Are there partial matches? Mm -hmm. uh, if so, can I can I filter it down to just these composers? Or uh, I think that's a really interesting um, potential use. Yeah. Um, just a few comments or hints. Um, I think the first thing is big data is very much in the mindset of the, well, I'd say, use encoding community. And the idea of uh, inputting large amounts of data and retrieving them for analysis. For example, there is one project in Tübingen, they, um, they encode a certain type of Gregorian or chance and try to. I think also visualize the historic and geographic development of these tunes that so far could not have been really analyzed because a human would not be able to analyze these thousands of sources. Absolutely. That's one thing. Um, one thing you should definitely have a look at is, although 20th, 20th century, is the curves for its library. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a encoding format with a set of analysis tools. For example, there is one tool I have seen very impressive uh, graph of the harmonic analysis of a piece in, in the form of a pyramid, where it anal analyzes the harmonics, the harmonies, and basically at the top of the pyramid is the the right. to the main key of the piece. Right, interesting. And there's lots of visualizations. Um, that's the second thing, I think maybe I will remember the third one. <laughs> Other questions? You, yes. You also use the, um, the methods of the music information retrieval for for extracting information from uh, from audio um, pieces, for instance, for, for analyzing. I know personally, but I do know that the, that there are uh, efforts in that in that regard. I just heard about something yesterday where they they take an audio uh, they, they they take audio and they're able to extract certain data. My brain is, is melted because of this, but um, there, there, are, there are definitely uh, people working on, on that problem. Yeah. I, I'm not personally. Mm -hmm. uh, I did want to, if anybody has like three minutes uh, left over, I wanted to uh, put this into a real world example. Uh, I, I wrote a piece called The Dewey Decimal <coughs> System, and I took uh, 12, I took 10 tones because it was uh, the Dewey Decimal System. Uh, and I made a 10-tone graph, uh, a 10 by 10 uh, vapor graph, and then wrote the piece as if it was a 12-tone piece, but only with 10 tonal tones. <laughs> so I, I wanted to play just a short excerpt if, if, if you will uh, allow me to here. Uh, so here is my 10-tone uh, row, and there are repeats. Uh, there are two E's and two A's, two G's. So it's, it's very modal. In its, in its construction, but then I created a, a, a grid and I actually generated the material for the piece from that. So I, I wanted to share the first uh, section, which is about a minute long. Uh, it's marimba and narrator and clarinet, and you'll hear the marimba playing. The marimba's playing the prime zero, and when the clarinet comes in, it's RI7, and then I think it's I7. I can't, I can't remember now, but just so you know that, that there's the, the twelve tone system is still a, a, a on oops ongoing.
classification and subject index for cataloging and arranging the books and pamphlets of a library. So this is the primary. The plan of the following classification and index was the result of several months study right, of so library economy. In addition to its own peculiar merits, this plan has all the advantages of the card catalog principle and of the relative location, which have been used and very strongly approved by prominent libraries. The immense advantages of this plan over those in common use will be appreciated by every librarian. <laughs> so, uh, that's like a nine minute piece and it's entirely generated uh, using Lily Bond uh, to get the graph and then all of the material I pulled out of that, uh, that, that row but it, it doesn't sound, I think, it doesn't sound like regular 12 tone music, because it's 10 tone music. All right, <laughs> that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. If, if you apply your analysis methods to your own words, do you find uh, correlations or never elements that you never thought of when composing a piece? I have never thought to do that, but I have, I've, now I'm going to. Um, I've had people say to me, oh, it was so clever how you used that there, and I said, I didn't even know I did that. <laughs> so I think as a composer, I turn off my, my analyst frame, mm -hmm. and I'm not 100% I'm not sure, but I, I should analyze my music. I think you're, you're onto something there. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. As a performer, we always guess what the composers yes. would yes. have had in mind, but we never know. And I sometimes never know what I had in mind either. That's <laughs> 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 <laughs>